Okay, our ne next talk is Marko Vukolic from IBM Research, uh, and he will talk about blockchain scalability. Okay, so I'll just change the slides here. So, uh, yeah, uh, when I prepared this talk, I realized that I'm going to probably be over 40 minutes, but fortunately, uh, Brian covered like a lot of aspects. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to jump into more technical description of challenges that are related to the first part of Brian's talk, so how to scale a blockchain. Uh, so basically, for the purpose of this talk, so you can follow it more easily, blockchain will be a data structure, which is a hash chain of blocks. Each block contains some transactions. We'll talk about the types of transactions later. But this data structure is not yet a blockchain unless we replicate it over a set of untrusted nodes. And then we use consensus protocols uh, to keep these replicas identical. So in this talk, we are going to cover uh, the basics of proof of work consensus that Bitcoin is based on. Then we are going to talk how Ethereum is trying to solve with proof of stake that Brian also mentioned, and the related challenges, right? So we will also see how the transition from a hard-coded cryptocurrency application that Bitcoin has to ability to code arbitrary distributed applications actually changes the game a bit and how it complicates the scalability. And then we are going to see what we did with the Hyperledger Fabric to address some of these issues. Uh, notably, when you move from distributed applications for blockchain coded in domain-specific languages, when you move to general-purpose languages, like what are the challenges, but also what are the challenges if you remove cryptocurrency? Like cryptocurrencies are motivating a lot of people to use blockchain, but they are also demotivating a lot of people because of speculation, etc. So, like, can you have this technology without native cryptocurrency? And then you have actually systems issues related to this. So, in principle, this talk is going to be orchestrated around two scalability bottlenecks, which are not the only ones, but for the sake of time, I'll talk only about two. So this is the performance of the protocol that orders across different nodes these blocks in a total order. So this is the basic component of blockchain. It's one of the scalability bottlenecks. But the other important scalability bottlenecks is the sequential execution of smart contracts. So what you execute, so, so when you validate a Bitcoin transaction, what you do is you validate one by one. And when you execute smart contracts in Ethereum, you actually execute them one by one on each and every node. And we'll see uh, how to address both. So we'll start with a brief description of, of how proof of work works. And essentially, uh, you heard from Brian's talk that there is a root hash of the Merkle tree of the transactions that are included in the block. Uh, there is the hash of the previous block, and then what, the, what each miner is doing is adding a nonce. And then the hash, cryptographic hash of all this concatenating together has to be smaller than some uh, target. So this target is called difficulty, and it's automatically adjusted every 2016 blocks in Bitcoin network, right? So it's adjusted in such a way that you can generate one block every 10 minutes. Uh, so currently, for each block, you need to perform two to the power of 80 hashes. And this is huge computational work. It's fairly simple because a crypto hash function is a known, uh, known uh, primitive, right? So you can optimize uh, for that. This is why we have a special hardware for doing this. Uh, but then again, it wastes a lot of, uh, lot of energy, right? And it's um, uh, so related to the question that uh, why can't you have a more useful work, right, than just guessing which hash, the nonce with which the hash of the complete thing is going to be smaller than the difficulty. One, uh, uh, one big problem is basically uh, how to verify the useful work, right? And then to uh, be unable to produce this useful work ahead of time. So here you're, ba you're based on the hashes of the Merkle tree, so it's kind of, for this particular block you need to do this particular work, right? So, so if you introduce useful work, it becomes more difficult. Anyway. Uh, the fundamental problem that drives the scalability of, uh, of Bitcoin are the forks, right? Because every miner works independently, so we are looking for these nonces independently of each other. So we can, of course, with some probability, we can find at roughly the same time a block with different transactions. So here you have the block 237 that I mine and block 237 that, that Brian mine, which contain different transactions, but they are both valid blocks. So what happens then is that you have the, the network 
shifts to one block or another. So some miners are going to adopt block A and some miners are going to adopt block B. And essentially they're going to continue mining on one of these forks, right? Uh, of course, miners are untrusted, so they can mine on both forks, but the property of Bitcoin protocol is that then you're wasting your computational power on both forks. And actually this reduces your chances of mining a block on each of them, right? So what you do is you adopt one, you typically adopt one that contains more work in a sense, so the longest chain in case you have a chain of equal length, like the branches of equal length, what happens is that you will choose one with a smaller difficulty, like one that was more difficult to mine. And then you go there. And eventually, right, one of the, how the conflict resolution works is that one of the branches will be extended longer and essentially will have the, the shorter branch orphaned. And then you have your chain back again, right? So this, as Brian was talking, so this is a critical point. Uh, there are two magic numbers in, in, in Bitcoin. One is the block frequency, like when you set this difficulty on expectation, you are expecting one block every so much time, and this so much time is one magic number in Bitcoin, so this is set to 10 minutes. And the other is size of the block, that's one megabyte in, in, in Bitcoin. So that, theoretically, if you do the math, you, you take the minimum Bitcoin size transaction that actually overestimates the throughput, which is 250 bytes. Bitcoin transactions are more like 500 bytes, so you should actually get the throughput, which is half of that. And the peak theoretical throughput is six to seven transactions per second. And then to have a very low probability of your block being orphaned, you need to wait for six confirmations. This is maybe a third magic number, Y6, right? But if you do some probability math, then, then it should work out. And then it gives you latency of about one hour. So if somebody came to the top systems conference back in 2008 and published a paper that has a, a throughput of six to seven transactions per second and latency of one hour, this paper will be rejected. But uh, Nakamoto didn't care, so he just deployed the system and uh, the system is used uh, today with all these drawbacks, right? Uh, so this reveals the importance of a killer application, if you want. Uh, so enormous energy consumptions, Brian, Brian talked about that, and there are different uh, ways you can picture this, but I like this one. So per transaction, uh, Bitcoin network is currently spending close to one megawatt hour of energy. So that per transaction, you're actually spending more than an average US household, which is not saving energy by no means, for a month. And that kind of gives you also the price of the transaction, inherent price of the transaction that's currently, it's of course you don't pay for each and every transaction of the Bitcoin network more than you pay for the household consumption in US, right, for the energy consumption, but this is amortized by the block rewards. So the question is what happens when the block rewards disappear, but this is another story. So uh, this is Bitcoin, right? So its performance is driven by these two magic numbers. So the question is what happens if we change these magic numbers? Right? So what happens if we have the block size increase to 10 megawatts? What happens if we go from 10 minutes, for example, to more frequent blocks? And it turns out that this is not so simple. Uh, there is a very nice paper from ETH Zurich, colleagues from ETH Zurich, uh, which basically looked at different uh, blockchain protocols. As Brian was mentioning, most of them are actually tweaks of these two parameters in Bitcoin. So for example, in Litecoin, the block frequency is 2.5 minutes. It's not 10 minutes. In Do Do Dogecoin, is one minute. Ethereum has like 15 seconds. And then it turns out that if you set, roughly speaking, if you set the security goals equivalent to Bitcoin network, what happens is that any tweak of these two parameters can get you to 60 transactions per second, but not more. So it's a very nice paper, I, I suggest you read it. And then the question is what do we do then, right? So, so there are different ways, so, so some people decided not to wait the branch, but to entire maybe sub-tree that's rooted in, the, uh, in a given node, but this more or less converges to this, these numbers. And currently the Ethereum network supports 15 transactions per second peak throughput. Okay, so if we want, we want to scale it, we obviously want more transactions per second, we want lower latency, 
right? So typically, so for latency from Bitcoin confirmation time of one hour, we can get to nine to 10 minutes, but this is far from something that, I don't know, it's called real time or maybe driven by the latency of the network or whatever, right? So the question is, what can we do? Uh, so I won't go historically, what can we do? But I will just continue through this line of thought that drives permissionless consensus like Bitcoin and Ethereum, right? Uh, so this is where proof of stake comes in. So proof of stake says that you are not going to weigh by your computational power, like the more computational power, that there was a question about inequality. Uh, the more computational power you have, the, the more chances, of course, you have to produce the block. So what proof of stake says is something different. So you already get, have your coins on the network, and the more coins you have, the larger the probability that you produce the next block. So this is roughly speaking how it should work. Instead of who has more computational power, now we look at who has more stake on the network. Uh, there is an obvious problem with centralization and richer get richer that, that uh, Brian was talking about, but let's, let's move from these social issues. Let's, let's focus just on technical issues. One of the main technical issues is nothing at stake problem. So what's a nothing at stake problem? Let me just address this question. Uh, when you have an off from block, you have a built-in inefficiencies blockchain. Is there a solution for forking? Uh, yes, there is. So we'll come back to that. Right? So we'll see that actually proof of stake needs to solve the fork in order to address the nothing at stake problem. So this is actually a good question because I have a slide on that. So what's a nothing at stake fork? So now you have our fork, right? And now, because of different reasons, right? Because the, the, almost the half of the network here heard from the block B and half of the network heard from the block A, currently everybody is honest, but they just are jumping to the different forks of the network, right? So you have 49% stake on one fork, 49% stake on the B fork. And 2% stake is idle for the moment, right? And let's say that they opt, that they opt to go to the to the A fork. So suddenly you have 51% stake on the A fork, and what network now sees is that basically it can jump, so everybody can jump to the, uh, to the fork A, and essentially block B is or orphan. So transactions in block B are orphan. Transactions in block A are valid transactions. So if I buy my house, I can buy it on, so the transaction for buying my house is on, in block A, so this means that I actually successfully bought a house. However, you have now, so suddenly we introduce malicious nodes that control, in this example, only 3% of stake. Okay? And they are kind of on both forks. So they were maybe, let's say they were all on A fork, but now my fork is on, so, so I'm moving my stake on B fork, and let's say I control this 3% of stake. I just bought my house, but I want my money back. Uh, basically, let's say that the, that the ledger for property position is, is somewhere else, like, like it is today, like it's not on the same blockchain. But I'm moving to the other fork where actually there is no transaction in which I paid for my house. And that actually has more stake now. So what do you do? There is an intuitive solution, right? So you need to do a few things. You need to prevent me from equivocating, you need to prevent me jump from jumping from one block to another. But this is not the part of the solution. And essentially, if you don't penalize me in any way, well, first you need to identify me. This is already a departure from permissionless notion of, of Bitcoin. So I need to have an identity in order that you can penalize me. Or there is this stake that's actually given to the network. So if the network detects that there is this equivocation, it needs to take the, so A, it needs to penalize me, and B, it needs to decide finally which block are going to, we're going to continue on. Because you can actually continue this game to 99% or even 100% support for both, for both forks. And this is where actually, so the solution for forking proposed by Ethereum, so this is not implemented yet, by the way. So this is proposed as early as 2015, but it's not implemented yet because there are issues associated with it. Uh, the goal is to leverage Byzantine fault tolerant consensus among these nodes that hold stake. So this is the protocol like Bitcoin and PBFT that Brian was talking about, and we're going to jump into one of them more deeply soon. 
but you use Byzantine folklore and consensus to agree on which block are we going to continue on as a network. Uh, so who is interested, there is a link, uh, I don't know if like slides are going to be published, but there is a link to, to like how Ethereum describes this protocol. So essentially what happens is that, so what is this BFT? Brian talked about it a bit, but BFT is a mechanism, so now we are rolling back in time. So BFT started in, uh, with state machine replication. So this is the classical distributed computing problem where you keep uh, the replicas of any service synchronous to each other, so where, the, where they keep the same copy of the entire state. Uh, it's, it's used everywhere, actually. So if for any cloud, if we were, this would be a workshop about cloud, we can talk about crash fault tolerant uh, implementations of uh, consensus, right? And here, the crash fault tolerance is not sufficient. So we need a Byzantine fault tolerance where actually a machine can do arbitrary faults. So this is where, so 40 years ago, this was used to model a replication system in which you would tolerate bugs. But it's much more applicable to the, to the blockchain setting where you actually have some machines controlled by different administrative entities, right? So, you, I mean, uh, in the end, uh, all, almost the entire Ethereum network runs the same code and for all blockchain you run almost the same code, so if you have a bug it actually spreads over the whole network. But when you model it more like administrative domains, then the model make, makes more sense. And those protocols are essentially avoiding forks by construction. So this is to answer the question. So if you use these protocols, what they do is they employ a different protocol than Bitcoin that we saw, but the motivation is to avoid forks altogether. So essentially we have this. Okay, and the main representative protocol uh, that Ryan also mentioned that we are going to jump into more details for BFT consensus is, was invented by, at MIT like 20 years ago. There were protocols before that, but this was first so-called practical solution to the problem. So how this consensus works, it works with the notion of the leader. So there is a notion of the leader that we can rotate among all the nodes. And this leader constructs the block. Uh, this leader tries to impose the block to all the nodes, so it essentially sends the block with all transactions to all the nodes. In this example, for simplicity, we have four nodes. So the leader is, of course, untrusted. It can send different blocks to different nodes. So you cannot just say, this is, this is the block that we are going to accept. So what these nodes are going to do is they're going to talk to each other, maybe after some validation of, of the block, and they're going to talk to each other and basically what did the leader tell you? He told me this block, maybe the hash of this block. You're not sending the entire block, you're actually sending the hash of the block here. And you are waiting for the qualified majority of the network to confirm this particular block and we'll see what this is. Unfortunately, there is a, this is not sufficient, right? To talk to each other once, but you need to do it once more. And I don't have one hour to spend, why? But you need to trust me that you need to do it once more, but not not for time, right? So you can actually stop here. So at this point, if the essentially two-third majority, so if you have a certain number of nodes and, and, and roughly speaking two-thirds of them agree on the hash of the block, it's actually the block that we are going to select under the sequence number 24. So this is how the protocol works. It's completely different trade-offs than in, than in Bitcoin protocol. So there is no heavy computation. There are some digital signatures left and right. There is some communication over TLS, so, so nothing, nothing special. There is no hashing, like continuous hashing or whatever. You have a more network intensive protocol. So this is also a scalability issue, not necessarily, I would say, because of ON square. So ON square communication is load balance across N nodes. So actually all of these protocols, if you implement them by the book, as I described them here, they scale inversely proportional to the number of nodes. So one over n. And we did some experiments with, with crash fault torrent implementation, with PBFT implementation that we did, it actually scales like one over n. It's still sufficient, like with 100 nodes, you can still beat Bitcoin by two orders of magnitude, but if you scale to 1,000, then, then you have a decay. The main problem is the leader. So for scalability, the leader, what is it doing? There it's sending the block to all the nodes. So if you send to four, that's fine. 
But if you send to 100, that's less fine. If you send to 1,000, that's even less fine. So you're bounded by the network bandwidth of the leader. And even the, the, the leader or, or the other nodes have computational, like ON computational work, depending on what is the other number of nodes. Computational, again, computation is not the bottleneck. It's more often, especially on wide area networks, that the network is the bottleneck. So what you need is some other mechanism for essentially content dissemination here. Uh, but the, so the, this line of research resumed a few years ago because you needed to commit, before that you needed to convince people that you need this kind of protocol at all because it was motivated by tolerating bugs. And there was always this argument if there is a bug it's going to propagate through the entire system, right? But here now there is a revived interest in actually scaling these protocols, right? And brands, Bitcoin is one example of that. Okay. Uh, Unfortunately, the protocol is not that simple. So this is how it works in the common case. And it, so actually figuring it out, so it's much more complex if you want, if you just look at the code, it's much more complex than Bitcoin protocol. But it's much more efficient uh, in, uh, basically it gives you much better performance. Okay. So this is where BFT in blockchains comes in. So it's important, it was always for, meant for permissionless blockchains, right? So if you have defined set of nodes, for example, leader needs to send to all, all nodes. It needs to know who all nodes are. Unlike in Bitcoin, which you never necessarily know who are the all nodes in the network. So this is where the permission flavor comes in, where you, can, you don't think of a central authority that authorizes the nodes, but you just need some notion of identity to assign to the nodes. But as we saw with proof of stake, its importance extends actually to permissionless blockchains as well. Because in the end, there, there will be no other way to effectively scale the blockchain. So this is why a lot of research is now focused on uh, scaling the BFT protocols. In principle, uh, these are the trade-offs. So you have proof of work on the left side and BFT consensus on the right side. The huge, like, why Bitcoin is, is, is better in some sense is for user management, for identity management, because there is none. Anybody can download the software and join the game. Whereas in BFT applications, you either define a set of nodes that are participating by their stake, by their identity issues, by some certification authority, or in some other way. But you have some, you need some way to manage the Sybil attack problem. Uh, scalability is related to performance, but we already talked about it. It's important to know that we can scale this, uh, this family of protocols very well. So there are existing implementations that easily go uh, beyond 10,000 operations per second. I'm talking about ordering only. So just the ordering of blocks. Okay. Uh, are there any questions at this moment? My explanation of forking solution was not clear. If the problem was solved in 2015, how come that it was not implemented three years later? That, that's the answer, actually. So I explained how the what the problem was, and I explained the solution which was not the real solution, right? Because you need other things, and this is the re one of the reasons it's not implemented three years later. It's actually a complex problem that involves more than what actually I can cover in one slide. So I hope the problem was clear. My, my goal was to convey the problem, but not the solution. Right? The solution, we are still looking, not we necessarily, but as a, as a community, we are still looking for that. In principle, we have an open research problem, is that given the use case network number of nodes, you tell me what is the most suitable blockchain consensus protocol, we know the answer for some of these parameters, but definitely not for all, right? And then in 2015, I, I wrote a paper in which I motivated the research for, for scalable blockchain, and essentially uh, all the solutions are scattered in this performance uh, number of nodes space. So you don't have a blockchain protocol that would be sitting up there to have a very good performance with very large number of nodes, but you have for different uh, basically network sizes and network deployments different solutions. So there are some, I'm going to just mention, not to break too much about, but I'm going to mention one solution, maybe two, of how to scale a protocol. So we saw that in, in PBFT protocol the leader is the bottleneck. So in 2015, we came with a proposal. This was not 
driven by blockchain, but it's, it's related to blockchain, is that at least in good cases, you can orchestrate not, maybe not 1,000 nodes, but if you have a blockchain with 100 nodes on a, on a cluster, like you could have in financial applications, in stock exchanges, etc., you can actually orchestrate them like that if nobody is faulty. You have some authentication here, but this is very lightweight. And what you're doing is you're load balancing the propagation of the block, and that actually goes, so the throughput of that protocol is when the, when the, when the things are good, when nobody fails, is actually bounded only by the network bandwidth that you have on your network. Yes? No, I'm not. No, no, I'm not, because what the protocol is doing is there is a bad node. It's like one third, again, in this example of four. What the protocol will be doing is just will reconfigure and not invent hot water, but fall back to a proven pro but less performant protocol. So it be still running a PBFT-like protocol, but only when things are wrong, when things are going bad. When actually people are behaving nicely in the protocol, you can have very, very efficient protocol. Fewer than one third, yeah. Uh, for this protocol and PBFT, yes. For the Bitcoin for proof of work, there are different assumptions. Yeah. Uh, regarding one third, actually, Bitcoin uses a lot of synchrony. So I didn't want to spend time on this slide, but we had a recent paper in one of the best systems conferences where we said, look, if you if you actually assume some synchrony in the network, and you then you can actually leverage this, and you don't need the, basically you can let the, mal the malicious attacker control more than one third of the nodes and actually go to any simple majority of the nodes. But I won't spend time why, I actually wanted to skip this slide. One, in one interesting line of research that's that's, that was only research in the context of crash fault tolerance, because it's diff difficult to get these protocols in software, so moving them to FPGAs or even, like, let alone ASICs is a, is a difficult problem. But what we did is we tried to, okay, take a simpler problem, see how crash fault tolerant consensus protocols can scale, and if you implement them on FPGAs, for example, again in clusters, you can go easily ordering only to millions of transactions per second. So this is also promising with, like, FPGA level energy consumption, which is very low. So this is a, also an interesting line of research. I'm not covering all of them. You heard some from Brian, and there are tons of others, like proposals for scaling blo blockchain consensus. We can talk about them for two hours. So let's just spend the rest of the time, which is not much probably, uh, on sequential smart contract execution. So I hope that I gave you some insights in where is the scaling problem at the ordering side, but we completely neglected the application that's executed on the blockchain, be it Bitcoin, cryptocurrency, moving cryptocurrency from account to account, or even worse, right, if you are coding arbitrary application, such what you can do in Ethereum, what you can do in Hyperledger Fabric. So what happens then? Uh, well, what's, uh, what's the smart contract or check code? Well, essentially it's any, uh, if, if your language to express this program is rich, like Ethereum, both to have a Turing complete language in which you can actually implement anything. It's called Solidity. And in Hyperledger Fabric, we are actually allowing applications in Go and Java or any other general purpose language. So you can again implement, in principle, anything you like. Uh, so what are the challenges then, right? Uh, any consensus that, that I presented so far, any blockchain, is working according to the order execute architecture. What this means, you order for example, in this case, this is summarizing proof of work mining, right? So miner mines the block, he disseminates it via gossip to all the nodes, but then the nodes need to validate this block, so which means that every node takes all the transactions in the payload and executes them one by one, sequentially. So this is done in Ethereum. This is done, for example, in Hyperledger Fabric. I'm taking the old example of V06. You, this is PBFT that you saw. But it's actually done the same way. So when you order this block, then you execute transaction sequentially. So what's the issue, right? And this is the summary. So you, this is how almost all blockchains work, except at least one that we developed recently, 
This is Hyperledger Fabric, the new version, version one. So all before Hyperledger Fabric version one, all protocols work under this order execute principle. So you order input transactions to the applications that you are executing, and then you agree on their order, and on each copy you are executing according to this order. Be it coming from proof of work or BFT protocol, it really doesn't matter. So what are the challenges here? So the main challenge is what happens if you code in Go or Java, if you look at the expiration time of the certificate and then you go to the local time and you're judging whether the certificate, for example, for the signature that you need to verify is, is valid or not. In most of the cases, it's going to be actually valid or invalid across all the nodes, but if it's right next to the expiration time, it's going to be biased by the local clock. And difference, so this is an example of non-determinism. If you have any non-deterministic application in Go, you iterate a map, voila, it's non-deterministic. So you need to be very careful what you're coding, right? So it's actually for us, this was a showstopper, right? So if you want to support smart contracts in general purpose languages, you cannot use order execute architecture because you might be executing, in the end, getting the state that differs across the nodes, even though you did consensus. So this is actually a show, big showstopper. What Ethereum is doing is they're going to say, they're not wrong, right? But they're going to say we are not going to allow determinism by construction. So here is the Solidity domain-specific language. Here is Ethereum virtual machine. It's going to be deterministic by construction. But then you're bound to coding in a domain-specific language only. So if you're asking why you cannot easily deploy on Ethereum something that doesn't compile to EVM byte code is actually there. It's non-determinism. The second thing is what if I code an infinite loop application? Well, in Turing complete language or, or Go, I can easily do that, right? And if, I, if we execute sequentially, this is my denial of service attack for your blockchain, and the blockchain stops working. Or just long executing applications. So I, I have an application that executes for three minutes. So what's the throughput of the system, right? It's easy to calculate. It's inversely proportional to the average latency of execution. So this is the artifact of sequential execution, and the solution in Ethereum is tied to a cryptocurrency. So you're not allowed to code everything you, anything you want, but you actually are in some sense, but you need to pay for every step of the computation. In what are you paying? In the native cryptocurrency. So there is the, the, the really deep link. It's not related to incentives or anything. It's really related to denial of service protection or why you may need to have a cryptocurrency on your blockchain. Yes? So Ethereum Enterprise depends on what you're doing. So if, you, if your Ethereum Enterprise is really the, if what you're taking from Ethereum is really the borrow EVM, Hyperledger borrow EVM, which is the open source, well, open source like the port of EVM, you can run it on Tendermint which is how borrow is, is meant to work. And then you don't have the, I think you can run at least the Tendermint in without the cryptocurrency. If you take Ethereum on its own, what you have is still a cryptocurrency. It's not the main Ethereum cryptocurrency, but it's just like, like a fork of Ethereum, right? But you still have this into it. But I think to support borrow, you need, uh, yeah, so then you need to activate also cryptocurrency on Tendermint. So intrinsically it's there, right? So, so you, need to have a, you need to have cryptocurrency on your copy of blockchain, which is maybe not ETH, right? Et, et, yeah, there, there is a difference, but you're still reasoning, you're still reasoning about it. Maybe, maybe the prices are different, so to persist like a very small number of bytes on Ethereum network costs like tens of bucks, right? Maybe it costs less on this other network, but it's a different story. It's just, so it's a challenge if you want to design by construction, which is what we have in Hyperledger Fabric, like where we treat, you can have cryptocurrency, but it's just another application. And if you don't want this application, you, you don't deploy it. And then you have a blockchain without cryptocurrency. And if you want blockchain with cryptocurrency, then you deploy a cryptocurrency. But you cannot really easily design the system. So this is what we faced. And just one slide on uh, what are the approaches to, to parallelization. Somebody asked, are we wasting with orphaning the block? Are we wasting the work? And there were proposals to say, look, we are going to look at all the blocks which can be orphaned in proof of work. 
And if they're not conflicting, like if, not, if there are no conflicting transactions, we can actually accept them all. And this is called the merge block in some proposals, right? So there is, there is nothing conflicting here. You can actually build not a blockchain, but block DAG, directly that cyclic graph. And essentially, you can execute these in parallel, right? There are, unfortunately, there are some other problems that I don't have too time to talk about, but there are no working block DAG solutions yet. But this is one promising aspect. The other promising aspect is you do, you turn to parallel execution in BFT consensus. I have one slide on that because this is what we did in Hyperledger Fabric. And of course, the third solution is you say, let's use sharding or partitioning. Brian talked about it. This is where Ethereum wants to go. We kind of implement it in Hyperledger Fabric because it's at least so like embarrassing sharding is easy. You just, just deploy different blockchains. Where it becomes more difficult is where you want cross shard transactions, right? And then we are yet to see the, let me be precise, not, not, not the research prototype, but really the production blockchain that does effectively cross shard transactions. So where I as a researcher am more interested is how to scale execution on a single shard. It's actually a bit, I'm not saying more challenging, but it's, it's uh, the issues that motivates me. And that brings us to Hyperledger Fabric. I just have one animated slide that might take two or three minutes, so I'm just going to be over time for maybe two minutes. Uh, this was published in Eurosys 2018, but what we did is uh, we started implementing this like, so V06 version of Hyperledger Fabric was implemented according to what you saw. There was a PBFT consensus, and then we are executing chain coding Go. We got tons of bugs, like your consensus is broken, because my application diverges to different state. Can you give us the application? Why do you need application? Because your consensus is broken. Can you give us an application? So each and every of them was iterating a mapping Go. And iterating a mapping Go is non-deterministic, and you lose consensus. And then we realized you're not going to ship this to anybody who can code non-deterministic code and blame you back again. So we need a different architecture. So different architecture looks as follows. It allows for parallel execution, and it has modular consensus and no native cryptocurrency. And you can code smart contracts in general purpose languages. If you want cryptocurrency, you can have it. So we have a fab coin which emulates Bitcoin on Fabric, and it gets to three in production system that you can actually download. It runs to 3,500 transactions per second on 100 nodes on wide area networks. There are some simple, really simple optimization spending to get it to 10,000 transactions per second. So this should come in a release soon. So what is it doing? Just one slide, which is important as a takeaway. So instead of order execute that we saw, we do this. So we execute first, and then you produce the state updates produced by your, your smart contract. And then we do consensus on these state updates. Essentially, the order is no longer on the input transactions. The order is on the output state that's coming from the execution of your smart contract. And then we are just validating in a sense that this execution is untrusted as well, right? So each application can define a certain number of nodes, which if execute the transaction in the same way, then it's validated. So what this is doing is essentially verifying a lot of signatures. And your arbitrary logic is actually here. So unfortunately, I don't have time more for this, right? Uh, I do have a slide that go, takes you for transaction flow, but in this transaction flow, uh, basically what is to be seen, what I want to highlight is just this thing. So after the execution, when you start ordering the read set and write set that are actually capturing the effects of the execution, this is entirely modular and pluggable. So you can replace it with the consensus of your choice in theory that of course needs to be ported to to be supported by Hyperledger Fabric. So production version is only crash fault tolerant if you download the code. And in just next week in Luxembourg in DSN conference, we are presenting a prototype which has BFT in collaboration with the University of Lisbon. Production BFT sh should be coming this year. So this is what we are working on. Uh, and where do we get 3,500 transactions per second is actually the validation step. is at the validation step when we verify the signatures, you can actually 
take the block and validate in embarrassingly parallel manner signatures. So you don't validate them sequentially. You just validate sequentially the read set and write set dependencies, so you don't have double spans, etc. But actually, the most computationally expensive part you can validate in embarrassingly parallel manner, which actually gets us to even 10,000 transactions per second. So to conclude, the near-term holy grail of blockchain scalability is typically this, and Brian's group is also targeting it. Can we have Visa-like performance number of hundreds of nodes? And a bit holier grail is, can we do this with some notion of confidentiality, like zero cash has? And then you are immediately far away from thousands of transactions per second. But what, what motivates my work is this, and this is the final slide, is can you have a blockchain protocol that on wide area network scales to the network bounded throughput, so you're bounded only by the network. We saw the example of a protocol that we have, but it works only in clusters. So the one that we have the chain actually prefixing the PBFT protocol. So can you do something similar on wide area networks? And that you're bounded by the speed of light, essentially, if you want net ping latencies, right? Depending on the number of messages that your protocol exchanges. And that's it, yeah. Thanks a lot. Some questions? Uh, well, we received one new here. Uh, I answered two, and then if there is one new. Uh, yeah, so the third question is about uh, blockchain is not scalable, not ecologically sustainable, not decentralized anymore. This is a huge problem. So uh, this is a governance problem that, that Brian was, was talking about. And I wonder if there is something, because in our economy as it works today, we have centralization of power that we know and we want a better world. But it turns out if you start from something that's decentralized, like Bitcoin, it converges back again to power of the few. And similar for Ethereum, it's even worse with proof of stake if you want. If you go to permissioned world, then immediately somebody will say, I don't want a permission, I want really democratic way, right? So this, this is a completely different topic, very relevant, but completely different topic. And I tend to be inclined to Brian's side to saying that we need some democratic way of counting the votes, but the technical solution is going to be anything but simple, like anything. Thank you again.